what I'm going to send where by kind of naming it a mm. drum bus or, a, you know, that kind of thing. So I, I'm trying all, at all times to let the song tell me what it wants instead yeah. of trying to tell it where to go, you know, so. I got it. So, so like any of those buses could be any combination of instruments, basically. Exactly. Very cool. Do you have any uh, practices to stay fresh and creative? Like we all, you know, go through periods where we're not inspired and, you know, we don't really feel like working. Is there anything that you do to kind of get into like a mix or, or a recording session or whatever, just like completely pumped? I I have like a, a playlist of of just mixes that I think are incredible. And it's hard not to get inspired when you hear them, or at least for me anyway. So I'll, yeah. <laughs> I'll listen to those for about, you know, 15, 20 minutes and... You know, I feel like I can run through a brick wall and just be like, man, that sounds incredible. Let's let's get to there. So I'm nice. very inspired by the work of a lot of other people. I think that's what one of the things that keeps me kind of fresh and going. Is this a Spotify playlist that you could hypo- hypothetically share with other people? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I use a uh, title generally just because uh, of the, oh, you know, the higher. It's uh, higher res. Yeah, yeah, higher res. But uh, yeah, for sure. All right, cool. I'll talk to you about that afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, yeah, I love it. Um, talk to me about, I guess, monitoring, because that's something that I've been thinking about recently. Um, I've been trying to, I've been realizing I think it's time for me to like up my monitoring game. Uh, not in like this, like I, my room is pretty well treated, but like in terms of the actual speakers itself, uh, themselves, uh, how are you listening? Do you have any recommendations? There's a lot of really good monitors out there. Um, the weird thing about monitors is, I mean, the room affects so much of how they perform. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I'm a big fan of, you know, in the last few years is definitely I've been moving into like the, uh, you know, a triamp or, you know, three-way designs um, just because everything now so much more low end and in, in most music and in order to make sure that you're delivering the kind of clarity in the mid range and you can, Make sure you're hearing everything you need to in the low, and it's kind of hard to get that kind of performance out of a two-way design unless they're very large speakers. So I, I've been a big fan of, of uh, the barefoot design stuff, the footprints, and, and some of the other smaller designs they have are really nice because they're sealed cabinets, so you don't have to worry about, okay, how far away am I from the back wall or the front wall? I mean, how much, you know, I mean, you, that's always a concern, right, dealing with the you know, quarter wavelength cancellations but because the box is sealed you don't have to worry about the port robbing you of your transients so you overemphasize mm-hmm. transients you don't need because the box itself is not fast enough because it's got a giant hole in it so um that's something that i think to my ears has always been something that i've been chasing is like oh this is why i like ns because it's a sealed box and everything responds really fast um but you lose out on the blow end so having a three-way design like that helps you kind of get back some of that bottom in without losing the impulse response of a fast box yeah so i'm a big fan of designs like that there's you know folk house making some really great stuff uh there's so many good companies out there yeah i'm, I'm looking at the the focal uh, shape twins but i need to save up a bit for them but that i was at a there's a shop in tel aviv that i was checking out they just that how they had all the focals are like the only supplier in israel and uh I was like, these seem like the best, like, like the whole range just sounded super even and like clear. You know what I mean? Yeah. Whereas like the six, the, the 6.5, uh, the shape 6.5s felt a little honky and the, you know what I mean? And the fives just mm-hmm. didn't have enough low end, you know, it was like a great, like, because there were two, I guess, woofers. To have the, yeah. The dual, the woofers are handy. That also yeah. kind of helps you not having to try and overpower, like, you know, um, you know, a, a speaker that's whatever overpowering its 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 design, so you're kind of over excurting it, you know, out of the box. And that's super handy. That's one. That's definitely a, a, a design choice. I've noticed a lot of uh, speaker manufacturers are going to, and I think that's super handy because it helps you kind of keep the speed of the box up, so you're not kind of getting super slow response in the bottom end. Yeah. Do, do you do you, do you mix uh, or ma- and slash master using multiple speakers or do you kind of just stick with one? Uh, when I'm mastering, I'm pretty much using just one. Um, mixing, I like to hear a few different sources, um, but I I kind of want to, and this is I guess my you know just my particular process. I, I wouldn't say that there's an advantage or disadvantage to 
using multiple monitors for mastering, but I just never have. Uh, it just is always kind of makes me second guess myself at that point. Uh, but definitely right, during that. mixing, it's <laughs> incredibly helpful to have multiple monitors. Yeah. What, like, uh, are you, so you, I assume you're using like barefoots and the NS10s in, in, in tandem just to get like that mid range clarity versus like the full spectrum kind of thing. Yeah. And I also, uh, I also have a pair of, uh, you know, the uh, oratones, which are really handy to hear a single speaker design, kind of see how your things are going to respond. Those are nice. And believe it or not, the, uh, the HS fives, the Yamaha HS fives that, you know, are kind of all over the place are remarkably good at translating for, you know, as small as they are. Yeah. I know our mutual buddy, uh, John Friedlander, um, uses them and I actually have the, the eighties, um, now that's which, which are the ones I'm trying to get rid of. Um, which actually translate really well in my room in the low end, but I'm, but the mid range is like just not translating anymore for me. I feel uh-huh. like I'm hearing things that aren't there and then I'll dip them out and then I'll realize that it just sounds worse and phasier now. I don't know. And I, and someone was telling me that it's because of where the crossover point is because it's only, it's only, a, I think it's only one, there's only one, it's not even, it's not by powered even, or is it by powered? I'm not sure, but it's definitely not triple powered. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah. It's probably it. Two way design. If I'm it's a two way. Yeah, it's probably yeah. two. Yeah, because it's like an eight inch woofer, so the mid range is getting like phasey and weird. Yeah, that's always a weird, tricky thing. Is is you know where the crossover is going to come at, and and the I think the unfortunate thing for a lot of two way designs is that crossover tends to be right around one k, two k, you know. And that's like the most critical area that you need to hear. So you're kind of hearing a combination of the two speakers at that point. And depending on whether mm. they've, you know, they've aligned it for phase coherence or gain coherence, you know, or, or a middle ground between the two, you can never quite know a lot of times what you're going to get without just knowing the monitor intimately. Yeah. And that might change from room to room as well. So. Really? Man, I've opened up a, a, a can of worms that you clearly know a lot more about than I do. Well, I don't know about that. I just, it's things I've given thought to. I don't know if I have great solutions for them, but. Yeah, I guess it's just about finding the right, the right, you know, monitors for you. <laughs> and that's really, yeah. And that's kind of really, it's, it's kind of, that's why the car test is what it is. It's, if you know the room or that you know the system really well, then, you know, you pretend to, you're going to make better decisions. I actually, I recently got the AirPods um, because I was listening to a, I don't know if you've heard of the Attack and Release show. Uh, it's a it's a podcast with two mastering engineers. Um, and they had a guest on who was talking about the fact that like most Americans, at least, and maybe, maybe even most first world country, you know, listeners are using AirPods now. Like it's like the number one place that people are, or the number one way that people are listening to music. So like... Why wouldn't you reference that? No, it makes perfect so, sense. Yeah. So I actually got myself a pair of AirPods, even though I'm an Android user. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that makes perfect so. sense. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I I hadn't considered that in a way. I wasn't sure that, uh, but it, no, it makes perfect sense. I guess people are listening to a ton of music on their AirPods. Yeah. I, I find that it really does help with the translation from my, like, I don't know, few months of experience with it, which has been interesting for me. It's good to know. I don't know. I'm gonna have to start yeah, give it a practice. shot. <laughs> you just taught me something very cool. That's awesome. Well, I learned it from a guy named Dylan Seals, so you can check him out. I give definitely him the credit. Will. Yeah, yeah. I guess I haven't had a ton of experience with uh, you know rap vocalists like you have. What's what's the? Do you have any like tried techniques for getting like that crispy upfront sound? There's uh, a few different ways to go about it. The, the performance is an enormous part of it, and whatever the original mic choice is for the, you know that particular person's voice is a huge part of it. One of the things that's helped me kind of get to that kind of hyper real, real crispy kind of thing is approaching the vocal as if it's kind of like a three band thing. So you're going to kind of roll off the bottom stuff that you don't need. And then, you know, in the flat of a way as you can to kind of maintain the original kind of character of the microphone it was recorded on in the mid range, pull that stuff back so you don't actually have to boost the top end because it's really just a matter of kind of putting some of that loudness curve in the vocal and then if when it was recorded the top end sounded nice and kind of at least moderately bright or balanced that balance is going to remain the same so you don't have to worry about stray frequencies getting crazy you know and, and making your gesture go nuts and in this way you're just kind of 
rolling back some of the mid range to make that top feel more crispy and then just compensating with output gain on your EQ. Um, that's one of the wow. ways that I've found I've had the most success getting that vibe. So just like straight up EQing and just knowing how to do reduction. Yeah. And using kind of broader kind of cuts instead of more precision kind of stuff, like to get the general bounce using a broad mid range kind of back down, you know, in that, you know, I don't know, 700 Hertz area with a kind of a wide bell and just seeing how much of that you need to kind of like make it feel crispy. And then, okay, how much bottom we need to roll out so that because you're by pulling that mid range back, you're making both the top and bottom louder. So it's kind of compensating by rolling some of that low end out after that. It's the inverse smiley and face. And then you have a crispy top that's still kind of the natural character of the microphone it was recorded on. Yeah, I think you like with like the the lack of DSing. If that if that really does lack of DSing, that probably will will work wonders because I feel like I mean I haven't done a ton of rap vocals, but I've I've always had problems with the S's afterwards. You know, and once I've done some compression and some EQ. Yeah, I <laughs> tend to set my DSer pretty low as well, like frequency wise, um, compared to I guess a lot of other people, uh, different approaches that I've seen. I tend to set mine somewhere in the neighborhood of about three point four kilohertz, which is wow. fairly low for a DSer. That's Most really people kind of don't move beyond that four K range, but to me, for whatever reason, it just seems to like help kind of knock it all back even more evenly. Uh huh. Uh, so it's like kind of like a it's like a broadband, not like a, a notch. Yeah, like and to I tend that. to use it more in like a split mode, so that it's just kind of touching back the whole top end equally, so it, you don't kind of feel the frequencies change as much. Yeah, wow. or at least to very my cool. Ear, you know. Nice. So, so tell me a little bit about like, do you do any uh, remote work, or is everything you do in person? Like, wh- like is that has that changed also with COVID? Uh, it has. I. I do a little bit of remote work here and there. Um, pretty much all the mixing and mastering I'm doing these days is all remote. I've done a few remote tracking sessions here and there. Generally, I'm still doing most of that in, in person. It's a lot less now that kind of the COVID is kind of running its course. But uh, yeah, it's definitely changed a few things, but kind of, I guess, the way that the, the Dropbox emailing world of, you know, sending files back and forth kind of was already on its way in. Yeah. It hasn't changed a ton of the things that I do. Do you have any advice for people that are trying to do remote sessions? Anything that, you know, you help you you felt maybe made things easier like the with communication or with actual technical, you know, aspects of it? Definitely being able to as as we kind of discussed earlier, um uh being able to have a visual is always helpful. In the same way being in a control room having a, a line of sight into the booth is always helpful. Um, because you can read between the lines. You're like You can kind of tell someone's headphone mix ain't great by their body language. And it's like, hey, what can we do to make this better so that you can do what you need to do? Um, so that's extremely helpful. Just being able, because sometimes people will just kind of roll with things. And then instead of just being like, yeah, I actually could love, I would love to have more of this or less of that. They're just kind of, okay, I'll just go with the flow and we'll just keep going. So that's extremely helpful just to, to not, you know, put an artist in a position where they're just kind of willing to settle for something that ain't great when they need more or less of something. Um, yeah. And then I, I would say one of the things that I noticed a lot um, in, in my particular tracking template, I have kind of set everything to be in the lowest possible latency available. I can always add more schmutz and smooge and, and other things later on. But when I'm tracking, I'm trying to get as close to, kind of an analog world where everything is happening instantaneously so that that's one less thing to worry about later um, is, oh, this isn't quite lined up because whatever latency we're accounting, especially when you're dealing with the remote session, knocking down whatever internal session latency is going on to as low as it can be is only going to help you. Mm. So you're using, I guess you're using like whatever the UA stuff to kind of get like that instant tone or whatever it is. Yeah, for any kind of, on the way in stuff, it's, I'm using the UA. Um, and then, you know, just monitoring wise, you know, I'm trying to not use anything that's not a, you know, zero latency world, whether, or as low as it can be, whether it's a, you know, um, yeah. a reverb or delay, whatever. It's just, I can always, like you said, just making sure that you're doing the, the, you know, the performance is it's due justice of getting, you know, the best performance you can by, you know, everything firing like it's supposed to instead of getting random kind of 
extra right. pre-delay on your reverb that changes the timing of how they perform, little things like that that, you know, are not a giant 